Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin our study again in Judges 16, in this portion that brings us to a, a vital area of understanding regarding Samson, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and for his guidance so that we may more properly understand these symbols and what they will mean for us at this time of verse history. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you because we need you. We recognize that we have great need of your wisdom, of your direction, and of your blessing. I thank you for those that are taking time today to meet, to consider, and to contribute to this study and for the studies that we need so that we may be better prepared in all ways to address these things that we will need to give the message that you would have given to this world. We ask for your spirit to be with us because we need your wisdom. We ask for your angels because we need your protection. Guide us now as we open your word. Help us to understand these symbols and to relate these symbols to that which we need to know at this time. We ask this, Father, so that your character may be glorified in all that we do. Be with us now. Guide us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we left off yesterday with the symbol of Samson now being related to that of Laodicea. But the, Phil the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Now, are the fetters of brass a symbol of judgment? Is that how we would approach this? Well, well brass represents sin. It also can represent judgment. You know, your heaven is iron, your earth is brass. <clears throat> um, So, I mean, the idea here is he is bound <clears throat> by sin, is the way that I would look at it. Mm -hmm. And so this would ironically be uh, those that are freed from sin. Now, when it says that they brought him down to Gaza, we are aware that the Valley of Sarek was north from Gaza. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, they would have brought him south. They would have been showing that they, as the Philistines, were more in charge outside of Israel. What else can we see here? What else, what else is there to address in this verse? Well, I mean, I mean, obviously the boring out of his eyes. So we would take this that he has in the ironic interpretation. These eyes 
symbolize blindness, but this would be the opposite of blindness, right? So he can see. And he's brought, they brought him down to Gaza. Um, so Gaza re represents uh, strength. But he's no longer going to depend upon human strength. Right, if, if we take it in the ironic story there, we, we, because it represents human strength. And then this grinding in the prison house, which he's doing as a slave, like an ox and on a, on a grist mill, he's, it's representing the refining process of God's word, the study of God's word. Right. <laughs> But he's doing this grinding in the prison house. Yeah. What symbol do we have for the prison house? Well, it's just it has to do with being imprisoned. I mean, so he's not prisoned. I mean, the movement isn't. Is God's house a prison house? No. No. So if we are looking at this in the ironic sense, he is being freed from his dependence upon his human strength. Would that be correct? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the Philistines are actually, in the ironic sense, providing him a blessing because instead of his <clears throat> literal vision, he now has greater spiritual vision. He is brought from human strength to greater strength. He has been bound with these fetters of brass so is he being freed to a better and clearer understanding of Christ? Yeah, so this would represent this movement, having their eyes enlightened, depending upon Christ's strength instead of human strength, and no longer bound by sin, and having a message that is refined. And that message is coming from the heavenly courts where there is freedom mm -hmm. and is not of man, which is of prison. Mm -hmm. Would that be a, a fair representation? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is this clear to everybody else? Are there other questions? <clears throat> Is there, are there other things that people are seeing here? All right. Mrs. White writes, but even this narrow escape did not serve to stay him in his evil course. The third step downward soon followed the second. Now, when they're talking about the third step and the second, what are we talking about here? Um, the first, second, and third angel's messages, but here, ironically. Correct. But the second step was Samson going to Gaza to the harlot in Gaza, the third step was Delilah mm -hmm. in the Valley of Sarek. What was the Valley of Sarek noted for? We covered this a few days ago. Well, it was the border between uh, Philistia and, um, and uh, Israel. But the Valley of Sarek a few days ago we covered <clears throat> was known for its vineyards. Oh, right, yes. 
And the symbol of the vineyards are what? Do we not grow grapes in the vineyards? Mm -hmm. So the grapes are symbols of doctrine. He did not again venture into the territory of the Philistines, but sought at home those sensuous pleasures that were lure, luring him to ruin. He loved a woman in the Vale of Serech. Her name was Delilah, which fitly signifies consuming or wasting. <clears throat> in the society of this enchantress, the judge of Israel squandered precious hours that should have been sacredly devoted to the welfare of his people. But the blinding passions which make even the strongest weak had gained control of reason and of conscience. Passion is the antithesis, the opposite of reason and of conscience. The Valley of Serech, a little valley not far from his own birthplace, was celebrated for its vineyards. These also had a temptation for the wavering Nazarite who had already indulged in the use of wine, thus breaking another tie that bound him to temperance, to purity, and to God. Here is Samson. He was to be one of great strength he was to be the leader of israel but he is giving himself into passion he's giving himself into the use of wine he was ignoring the need for temperance and ignoring the need for purity is this what the 144,000 are to do Is Samson giving us a lesson <clears throat> in the right arm of the third angel's message? Mm -hmm. And its need for us today. Mm -hmm. Now, just a, a little note here. Um, the date that this is published in the science, mm -hmm. October 13th, 1881. Right. Um, and as we know, October 13th is uh, the Fatima miracle. It's right. The date that Babylon fell in 539 BC. And it's also uh, the date, of course, that we uh, did the calculation, or I did the calculation of the 391 and a half days that confirmed November 9th. So it's tied to November 9th. Um, um, so, you know, so the fact that, that we have this date here with this story of Samson would also tie it to this movement. It binds it rather tightly, doesn't it? And, and 1881 is a mirror as well. Which we're looking at this story as a mirror. On the biblical calendar, what was October 13th, 1881? Yeah, I can look it up here. Um, it's the 18th day of the seventh month. Oh, wait, no, pardon me. That's wrong. <laughs> it's, it's the 19th day of the seventh month. Okay. We're is the 18th day of the seventh, but it's the 19th day of the seventh month of Tishri. Um, Does it not fall during the Feast of Tabernacles? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Currently, 
as we are studying this, are we in the biblical time of the Feast of the Trumpets right now? Um, today? Yes. Uh, no. Tomorrow's the 10th day of the seventh month. Well, if it's the, if tomorrow's the tenth day of the seventh month, that's the Day of Atonement. Right. Yeah. So then we're in the Feast of Trumpets. Yes. Okay. So we are currently being called together to be prepared, either for a convocation or for war. Right now, I would say that we are being pulled for a convocation. Something that we need to understand. Mm -hmm. The Philistines were well acquainted with the divine law and its condemnation of sensual indulgence. <clears throat> they kept a vigilant watch over all the movements of their enemy. And when he degraded himself by this new attachment, they saw the bewitching power of the enchantress. They determined through her to accomplish his ruin. Is it not a sad statement that the Philistines were well acquainted with the divine law that Samson was setting aside? Mm -hmm. How much more, <clears throat> how much more today is the world acquainted with the divine law that is not being honored within the movement and within the church. What are you referring to specifically? How many times within the movement are we seeing those that are willing to be critical of brothers and sisters? How many times within the church are we seeing specific things that Mrs. White has warned us against, things that should not be on our table that are still well accepted by the church itself? How many times are the Philistines of today more acquainted with the divine law, with what God has had to say, than with what we are looking at currently. So we, we're seeing here the Philistines were well acquainted with the divine law and its condemnation of sensual indulgence. Accordingly, a deputation consisting of one leading man from each of the five Philistine states <clears throat> was sent to the Valley of Sarek. It was not their purpose to seize him while in possession of his great strength, but to learn, if possible, some means by which that strength might be taken away. Within this portion, we have confirmation of what we've been studying, that one party from each of the five Philistine states came to Delilah. Such marvelous power, far exceeding anything that they had ever known before, that of the famed descendants of Anak, who dwelt among them, could not be compared with it. And the Philistine lords decided that it must be supernatural, the result of some condition that might be changed or some charm that might be broken. They therefore bribed Delilah to discover the secret of his strength and to reveal it to them, offering her 1,100 shekels of silver from each of their number, aggregating a sum of more than $3,000. $3,000 in 1881 would be a huge, <clears throat> amount of money right now because $3,000 then 
was indeed a huge amount of money. Mm-hmm. Now, when it's giving reference here to the sons of Anak, the descendants, the fabled, famed descendants of Anak, that Samson was stronger than them. If we look at this, let's say a hundred and so years later, that would mean that Samson at this time would have been stronger than Goliath's progenitors. That's a point for us to consider at this time. But here we have this this 1,100 pieces of silver times five having this great value. As the betrayer plied Samson with her questions, he deceived her by declaring that the weakness of other men would come upon him if certain processes were tried. When she put the matter to test, the imposition was discovered. Then she accused him of falsehood saying, how canst thou say thou lovest me when thou hast deceived me and lied to me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. Samson's infatuation was almost incredible. At first, he was not so wholly enthralled as to reveal the secret, but he had deliberately walked into the net of the betrayer of souls, and its meshes were drawing closer about him at every step. Three times he had the clearest evidence that the Philistines had leagued with his charmer to destroy him. But when her purpose failed and his strength returned, she had treated the matter as a jest, and he blindly banished all fear of danger. How great was his deception at this time? And does this blind acceptance of this deception relate to the movement today? Okay, so, you know, we have this this story. We, we're, we're running two parallel stories. Right. The, the one and, and the, the symbolic one that's understood ironically. Now, I mean, the one thing that we can see is that um, this moral story does represent what's happening in the movement in the negative sense. Right? Right. Um. And then, of course, the symbolic, um, ironic story represents what's happening in the movement uh, in a prophetic sense as far as the progression of the movement to accomplish its goal. So it's the opposite of what's happening morally. Right? All right. So, so, you know, as we look at these two stories together, they're obviously a parallel story. They're two classes. In a sense, Samson is representing the one class, but the symbols that are attached to it represent the truth, right? That's how we're understanding it. I would say so. So as we look at what's happened in this story, um, could we take these, these tests as representing something that has happened in the movement, in the moral sense, not just the ironic and um, symbolic sense. So, so it'd be a different line, a different story in a sense. But has ha, have people in the movement, or has the movement been uh, beguiled? And, and I'm not saying that, that that's that you know that I know the answer to that, but um, you know, and how that would 
how we would um, in, understand this. You know, because there's these three times. Do these represent some events that have occurred in this movement in regard to July 18th message? Well, would we apply this to the situation that occurred with the book of Joel that led to the separation from Jamal, Dario, and the others out of California? Would we well, also look at this in reference to the situation that occurred with Emiliano. Yeah, see, I don't think that we could. I would think that this has to re relate to Ju the July 18th prediction. Because, I mean, if these are parallel stories and we have the ironic symbols, they're all pointing to uh, stuff that happened long after Emiliano and, and the others. Um, so this would have to be much more immediate um, if we're going to understand this story. I mean, obviously, each line always applies to other lines. So, I mean, you could take this and apply it to the church. You could apply it to the time of Christ. Right. So there's lots of places we could apply it. But as far as the symbols that are here for us now, these are all symbols regarding, um, you know, October 13th, November 9th, July 18th, December 25th, 2021, right? These are okay. all symbols that would be attached to the present situation, the, the, the tests that are before us in other parts of the story of Samson. So, so I would think if we're going to apply it, we're needing, we need to apply it that this is happening now, that the movement or the message has been beguiled. Okay. And of course, people who would look at it, so the part of the thing about this is if we're going to have these people look at this situation, um, And, and people can help me here because Dwight just had to go away for a moment. Um, so if we're going to look at this situation as what has happened recently, where would we place this? Has there been something that, that we could align with these three tests? And, and then a fourth. Anybody have thoughts on that? Okay, so 11, 9, 7, 18, and 20, 12, 25. So if we're going to take that this refers to 11, 9, how could we take, because we've already applied that in the symbolic sense. So we've taken, we've taken an application where we can take the seven bowstrings and then the rope and then uh, this loom with the hair woven into it that they could represent November 9th, July 18, and December 25th, 2021. So... So we can look at that at the symbolic story, but how would we take the moral story? What, how has this movement been beguiled, I guess, is the question. How is it, where has it gone wrong? For instance, at, on November 9th with Parminder and Tess, who, who gave us that date, can we apply it in this way? Can we apply it somehow to uh, 
a failure there. And it would be the first test, which would represent the first angel's message. Do people understand what I'm getting at here? Anybody not understand? So if we look at the date October 13th, right? So we know October 13th, 2018, um, we have this calculation that's done of the 391 and a half days to November 9th. Was, can we parallel that in any way with the seven bowstrings? Is this a beguilement? Is, is there a beguilement attached to that message? Well, there was in the sense that Tess had all these predictions about what was going to happen on November 9th, 2019, and they all failed. Okay. So if that beguilement didn't last too long, except with her followers okay now for me the beguilement is is partly the the events that she predicted but what i remember is there was an online study group um out of california i believe um i can't remember the name but they were looking at november 9th as this close of probation and that they were going to become holy right that is it was going to be um, Daniel 12, 1. Michael was going to stand up. Their probation would be closed. They would no longer sin. And it wasn't just that group. There was people in, in Canada, people in the, U, the U.S., in, in Arkansas, who were believing that, because we were in Arkansas at the time, were believing that somehow November 9th, they had to get rid of all their sins, and then once they got to November 9th, they would now be sealed and they would never sin again. So if we're going to take November 9th as that first test, there is the positive side, those that actually are following the truth, but there's those others who are beguiled. They're beguiled by this woman but in the negative sense, right? So we know that these two things, Delilah represents, you know, July 18th. She represents the prophetic mirror. She represents um, the 26th day of the fourth month, because we've done that as a symbol. But on the moral side of it, did the same things that produce, is the same message that produces the five whys, does it also produce the five foolish? And the question is why? Why would a true message also have attached to it something that beguiles, right? Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, because uh, some people desire truth and accept it, and some people turn from it. And when they turn from the truth, what are they filled with? Falsehoods. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have truth, but Satan uses truth mixed with error. Correct. Correct. And and I, and I don't like to look at you know this analogy that there's like like a coin. But there, there are two sides to something that is true. That is, truth can be used to, to mislead people. Satan uses truth, just like he did in the Garden of Eden. Um, just like he did with Christ's three temptations. Right? He's not, he's not approaching him in, in honesty, but he's using God's word. Um, and things that, that Christ would know as a means of temptation. And 
and this is this is part of the problem i think when we look at the december 6th declaration and their their assessment that we were wrong um they're failing to recognize where we were wrong the wrongness was not the dates or the numbers the wrongness had to do with us in our character correct right but we approached it all wrong god had given us these this message but instead of understanding what the message was to accomplish we, we actually had turned in a sense the message on its head um for human reason our pride and many people use righteousness as a cloak for sin so so i think if we look at this this moral story then um this moral story is showing us the side of the movement that has been beguiled by satan but the symbolic story shows those who have not been beguiled those that have been victorious kind of pointed isn't it mm -hmm. Day by day, <clears throat> Delilah pressed and urged him until his soul was vexed unto death. Yet a subtle power kept him by her side. Her heart was set on the tempting bribe. And she exerted all of her blandishments to secure it. Overcome at last by the bewitching spell which he seemed to have no power to break. Samson made known his secret. There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my birth. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. Now, here again, he was already weak in the moral sense because he would not leave this woman's side or as mrs white had said overcome at last by the bewitching spell which he seemed to have no power to break he could break the ropes he could break chains he could break many items he was stronger than the progenitors of Goliath. Yet, he could not leave Delilah's side. How do we approach this both morally and figuratively? How do we turn this on its head? Well, when it, when it comes to this razor, I mean, we, we've dealt with it a little bit. I mean, this, this means to alter, right? Uh, but we're not using it here um, in, in the symbolic sense to, to be an altering, but here in the moral sense, it is changing him from his um, purpose, right? They've gone out of the way. And, you know, this, this movement professes to believe in Millerite history. But we, we saw how readily all of the past could be just cast aside. And, and the question still I ask is why? Because I don't fully understand how you could have people who believed in July 18th and believed in this message, and even, even before, before July 18th, how you could have 
all of these Adventists who are uh, following uh, this message do a 180, you know, under Parminder and Tess. And, and some of these have been Adventists a long, long time that I know who just took the whole thing hook, line, and sinker um, and just totally changed from how they had been living their life as an Adventist, uh, just going straight back into the world in this new uh, quasi-Adventist um, movement. I mean, it's just they went from basically being uh, conservative Adventists to ultra liberals. So how does that happen? What is this bewitching spell that seems to have power over people? So that their strength, the source of their strength, their commitment to God, this Nazarite vow, um, is going to be broken. Well, <clears throat> what was Samson focused on here? Well, really, he was focused on himself. I mean, there's Delilah, but... I agree he was focused on himself. But we can also see that he was not focused upon Christ. Right. And, and he's always going after these women. He is indulging in passion. Yeah. But women, women represent a church. Uh, I mean, the one thing I find odd about Christians, um, in my experience, in my whole life as, as a Christian, is I've never understood um, why people are interested in um, sort of being a Christian, that is, appearing as a Christian, without being converted. I mean, uh, you know, part of it is I'm just not really interested in what other people think of me. But for many people, it's really an appearance. That is, they have a form of godliness without the power of God. But I, I've never understood why people would play church, right? Continue to go to church, continue to be, let's say, a Seventh-day Adventist when you don't even believe in ad the Adventist message. You know, you're, you're studying the Bible in a Sabbath school, right? You're doing the Sabbath school lesson. And yet you have no interest in the cross of Christ. You have no interest in truly being a Christian. Why, why go through the motions of it? Well, I've always had to consider something else. In the years since my family came into the Adventist church, there has been one overriding theme that has been espoused, taught, accepted, and lifted up within the church. And what is that one theme? Well, we're not a cult. That's the one thing. I'm referring to the Sunday law. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. So, so we talk about the Sunday law that's coming, yes. Now, where's our focus when we're talking about the Sunday law? Well, it's not receiving the mark of the beast. Where is our focus when we're talking about the Sunday law? Okay, the focus of where it's going to come from comes from outside. Does it come from God? Is the Sunday law that of God? No. Where is it coming from? Well, from the papacy, from the event. Thank you. Yeah. We are studying 
we are looking at that which is not of God. Mm -hmm. The more we are looking at that which is not of God. The more we become that which is not of God. Thank you. Yeah, so the thing that I noticed when um, I became an Adventist, and I talked to old, older Adventists, there, there always seemed to be this attitude, well, we know that Saturday is the Sabbath, and we know that Sunday is the mark of the beast. We know it's going to happen. We're not going to be deceived. We know how Jesus is going to return, so we won't be deceived by any Antichrist. Um, and that seemed to be sufficient for them. They weren't really interested in overcoming sin. They definitely weren't interested in health reform. Um, so, so there's some kind of security that that people can have when they're uh, they have a form of righteousness. Now, the question is: Is this bewitching spell something where we think? We're all right when we're all wrong. Yes. Okay. And and so it's these false doctrines. Valley of Sarek. What's that? Valley of Sarek. Right, yeah. The wine. Yes. That bewitches us. So it puts us into a state where we believe that we are okay, and it's the worst condition to be in. It would be better to be in the world and know you're in the world, to be in the world, but you think you're in the church. You know, in, in the studies that I'm doing on, on righteousness by faith, you know, we're leading to... Um, to tr try to understand something. And, th and the one thing that, that I think that is not understood is how unlike God we are, how sinful we are, how our thoughts and our feelings are totally the opposite, that we're at enmity with God. And I, I don't think Adventists realize this. They think because they believe certain things that they're okay. And of course, that's the Laodicean condition. You know, the Laodicean condition is, is like, you know, I'm glad I'm not a Laodicean, right? Which, of course, is the Laodicean condition, right? If you think you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, you're Laodicean. But many people... Um, take pride in the fact that they're not Laodicean. Which means they are. Right. Right. A.T. Jones makes this really clear, that we're Laodicean. You know, we can't, we can't pretend we're not. But I don't think that we fully, because we focused on the negative, the, the problems that others have, how other people are deceived, how we're better than other people because we don't believe like they do, or we're better than, you know, the Catholics, we're better than the Protestants, um, we're better than these people in the church or that person in the church or some offshoot or whatever we think we're better than, uh, we're testifying that we're actually worse. we just don't know it. And I think that that is the problem that this movement has faced, is the reason why we're not humbled, why we're not listening to others, why we're, we're, we neglect to study things out, is because we are secure in our own delusion. We are secure, not in our own delusion, but in our own strength. 
Yeah. And here, if you look at, at, at Solomon, or not Solomon, Samson, where he's, he has not kept his Nazarite vow, right? Correct. He thinks it's all about his hair. Is it? No. No, it's all the other things he hasn't kept. And so when he, he breaks down and makes known the secret, I mean, he's still, in a sense, in a delusion. There's no reason that God's power should be manifest in him. He hasn't kept his vow, and yet he thinks it's in his hair. And, and if, if we're going to put that on our movement at the present time, what is it that they think their strength is in? Would it not be in the seven times, for instance? Right. Right. So we, just like the Adventist church, trust in something that in and of itself is not going to help us. But we think because, you know, God has led us on this far and we, we haven't had our power taken from us, that we're on the right track. But we're still just as proud as we were before any of these dates had passed. Exactly. So, so we could look at it this way. Okay, so we have these three tests. We can look at these three tests, November 9th, July 18th, December 25th, 2021, as these parallels to what happens with Delilah and Samson on the moral side of things, right? Okay. Because we can see that they're symbolically on the, the ironic side of things, those dates are being marked. So, but on this, this moral side of things, then when we have this fourth test that, that Samson now is going to experience, what would that fourth test be? What is the thing that's going to cause Samson to have his eyes put out and to be bound in prison? What's, what's for this movement, for the negative side, you know, this moral side? Um, what what would what would that be i mean it would have to be something similar to november 9th july 18th and um the december 25th 2021 the reason i was going further back was that i'm having to ask if this situation this fourth test is not the combination of November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th. Well, the combination of that, to me, that would be what Osdilio is presenting and what Colin is presenting. Okay. Because that is what we see in um, these predictions. It's, it's using what we already knew, right, what we already understood, and it's correct chronologically. That is... When we look at the structure that Adilio has, and we look at what Colin has, they're, they're correct. The problem is what we are expecting. Because we're expecting that God is going to work on our behalf when we haven't been converted. Right. Okay. Like when, we're, when, we're, when the movement has not done the task that it's been asked to do. When we're not right with God. And, and we're not right with each other. So to expect that God is somehow going to honor the Nazarite vow that we have made when, when we have abandoned our Nazarite vow doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And so it, it but yet we also know on the ironic side of this, if we take this story, that we see a victory happening. So people have a choice before them. Are we going to be truly converted or not? 
are we going to trust in our understanding or even even of things that God has given us because God has given us these dates but are we going to trust in those dates not fully understanding them because we're we're not like God at all we're still operating with our own wisdom and our own understanding no recognition of our true dependence upon God and the evidence of that of course is how we treat one another Agreed. Because if we're not willing to treat each other with respect as we would wish to be treated, then we are not treating each other as Christ would treat us. Treat us. Well, we're not following Miller's rules. And, and a specific way in which we're not following Miller's rules has to do with the aspect of the conversion part. Because when Miller's last rule, where he says, uh, th which is the most important rule, is that we much ha must have faith. Right. I mean, he's really talking about not just, um, you know, confidence in God, that type of faith, but he's actually talking about living the Christian life. Right. We must have faith. That is, we must walk by faith. We must have righteousness by faith. Because we know that the study of the scriptures is totally parallel to uh, our walk in righteousness. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. God's word is a lamp to our feet, a light unto our path. He leads us in that walk with him, step by step, as the light of that candle follows us along the way. Right? That lamp, the, the lamp, you can't, you, you're holding the lamp. You can't advance on the path if you wait for the darkness in front of you to disappear. You only have light for your feet. And this is the walk of faith. This is trusting in God day by day. Okay. Eagerly the betrayer listened to his words, fully convinced by his serious and earnest manner that he had told truth. And she determined to profit by it. A messenger was immediately dispatched to the Lord of the Philistines, urging them to come once more to her chamber without delay. She next sent for a man who, while the warrior slept with his head upon her knees, shaved off the heavy masses of his hair. Then, as she had done three times before, she called, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Suddenly awakening, <clears throat> he thought to exert his strength as before and destroy them all. But his powerless arms refused to do his bidding. And then he knew that the Lord had departed from him. When he had been shaven, Delilah began to annoy him and cause him pain, thus making a trial of his strength. For the Philistines dared not approach him until fully convinced that his power was gone. Then they seized him, and having put out both his eyes, they took him to Gaza. Here he was bound with strong fetters of brass and kept in their prison house as a trophy of their victory and compelled to drudge in hard labor. How does Delilah annoying him and causing him pain give a representation to the movement today? The 
movement seems to be focused on the world and the things that annoy and give them pain. I could hear you, but it, you know, I don't know if it comes across real well on the recording, but the movement is focused more upon the world than it is upon God. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, that's correct. Now, has the movement at this time been shaven? No. Okay, why? Because we have to wait till Collins and Odilio's predictions pass. Okay. Both of their predictions are focused more upon the world than they are on anything else. They have elements of truth, I give you that but they are more focused on the world at this point, right? Mm -hmm. yes. well, and see, the thing is, this heritage that we've received as Adventists, as you pointed out about the Sunday law and the papacy, the problem that I always had and the problem that I still have is the focus is upon the sins of others, not upon our own sins. Right. Whether we're critical of, of other people within the movement, whether we're, you know, critical of the people out there in the world, we always feel justified because we're not like other men are. Like we do the right things. And that's where our security lies, but it's a false security. And, and when it comes to prophecy, we're, we're trusting in our understanding of prophecy while not having the character of Christ. Okay. Now a question is being asked. Or maybe this is not a question in the Hebrew. I don't know. <clears throat> Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaved, after he was shaven. Why was his hair began beginning to grow after he was shaved? Well, if this refers to the prophetic symbols that are tied to the 2520, right? We could see that after the failure of these predictions, we're going to have a greater understanding that's going to come in connection with the 2520. What a change to him that had been the judge and the champion of Israel. Now weak, blind, imprisoned, degraded to the most menial service. Little by little, he had violated the conditions of his sacred calling. God had borne long with him, but when he had so yielded himself to the power of sin as to betray his secret, that moment God departed from him. There was no virtue in the length of his hair in itself, but it was a token of his loyalty to God. And when the symbol was sacrificed in the indulgence of lustful passion, the blessings of which it was a token were also forfeited. Had Samson's head been shaven without fault on his part, his strength would have remained. But his course had shown contempt for the favor and the authority of God, as much as he had in disdain himself severed his locks from his head. Therefore, God left him to endure the results of his own folly. Now, little by little, he had violated the conditions of his sacred calling. 
what nation was it that had originally been chosen of God to have been the champion of the Reformation? Um, so you're saying, um, mean at the beginning of the Reformation? Well, yes. What, what nation was it? You're going to have Wycliffe. So England. Well, if I go back into a presentation that Elder Jeff made, did he not state that France would have been the nation initially chosen to have been the champion of the Reformation. Hmm. And that awesome. they, they abandoned this and that abandonment wound up being the reason behind what they went through. Okay. I mean, in England, What they did under Henry VIII, they retained the form of the religion of the Pope. They just said that they weren't going to accept the Pope as their head. Here in America, little by little in America, we have seen that this nation has been violating the conditions of its sacred calling. Mm -hmm. We have seen the same thing happen within the churches. We have seen this happen very directly within the corporate church. That little by little, the violations of the sacred calling have occurred. We've set aside admonitions on diet. We've set aside admonitions upon relationships. We have also set aside in the Adventist health system who is our leader? When we began through the Adventist health system to agree to perform abortions. Can we afford in any manner to violate the conditions of our sacred calling? How are we to, to walk in God's path if we have decided that in our own strength that we are just enough, that we are righteous enough? How are we to do this if, like in 1888, we are more concerned for the money than we are for the character of God? God has borne long with us. Are we to yield ourselves to the power of sin? Is it not speaking volumes that had Samson's head been shaven without fault on his part, that his strength would have remained? The Philistines understood the law of God. Delilah understood the law of God. If Delilah had come to this understanding on her own, and if Samson had fallen asleep on her knees, and she'd had someone shave his head without Samson telling her this, he would have remained the judge and the strength 
within Israel. But he made a choice. We spoke a few minutes ago about the choice that many that have been in this movement, that have been Adventists all their lives, made in following PNT. They made a choice. How many households do we know that were divided because of this situation with PNT? How are we to go forward? Are we not to trust fully in God and not trust within our own understanding and in our own strength? In his sufferings and humiliation, a sport for the Philistines, Samson had opportunity for reflection, and he learned more of his own weaknesses than he had ever known before. As his afflictions led him to repentance, his hair began gradually to grow, indicating the return of his extraordinary powers. But his enemies, regarding him only as a fettered and helpless prisoner, felt no apprehension. So in the moral story, yes, Samson does learn of his own weakness. Yes. In the symbolic story, does he not learn the source of his strength? Mm -hmm. But how does he learn this? Well, he learns his own weakness because he is basically failed in, in everything that he was supposed to do. He's learned it through reflection. Yeah. He's had to consider what has happened before. Yeah. And, and that's what I believe is going to happen to this movement. I believe that... Um, People within this movement are going to take time to look at what has happened and, and consider their own course. I mean, we all have to. Because we're all really a part of this. Right. Yeah, there's not an us and them in the movement. You know, when I, when I think about the uh, December 6th declaration, um, you know, they actually did have an opportunity for reflection, but didn't take it. All right, please explain. Well, you know, we had the failure of July 18th, and what the movement should have done is taken the time to examine um, ourselves Instead, they were focused upon examining others to find fault with others. It was someone else's fault. Right? Okay. And, and particularly me, I, I was the one that was at fault. But, you know, if they had taken the time to reflect upon their own characters instead of upon, you know, what they perceived as being the, the problems with chronology or whatever, because they didn't even really address those, other than they just rejected the message. But if they had reflected upon why, why had God not had Nashville occur, even though everything pointed to it, um, we could have come to the upper room much sooner. We had that opportunity. But that's been the point that has been overlooked for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
And, and now for some, the idea is, well, um, <coughs> so, so you have on the one hand this, this group of people who just rejected the foundation of this message. Basically, I believe the foundation of Christianity. Um, but we had another group of people who still held on to July 18 in some way. Uh, they weren't as open in their um, criticisms, but yet still had the same spirit and the same attitude regarding chronology, right? Okay, correct. So, so there, there's still something wrong with it. They're gonna they're gonna accept July 18th in word, but not really accept um, how we got there. So they're going to say, well, we still accept the symbolic new use of numbers, but it needs to be much more simple. We can't have something that's so complex. It's getting too complex for us. Um, and, and then focusing on, as we've talked about before, a, a counterfeit right arm of the gospel, a counterfeit medical missionary work, and a counterfeit righteousness by faith which is really no different than the righteousness by faith of the Pharisees. It's the righteousness of the Pharisees. And if I just do this or do that, then I'm righteous. And not recognizing that um, it's the meekness and lowliness of Christ that we need, not um, some adherence to some rules externally without a heart being changed. Because if we have attitudes that we have towards others, it doesn't matter that we don't eat between meals, right? That's not going to make us righteous. These little tiny things, which are important, all those little things, I mean, they can be, they can be things that lead us astray. And Ellen White's quite clear on that. But those things in and of themselves don't make us righteous. Just like when the Pharisee said, well, I tithe in mint and cumin and I fast twice in the week. And I'm not like this publican, but they don't go down to their house justified. Only the publican does who says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Right? So these little things are important, but they don't make us righteous. They don't make up for our attitudes towards others, our self justifications in other areas of our life. Our lack of conversion. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is what has to happen, this reflection. We have to know more of our own weakness than we've ever known before. And, and these afflictions that we have gone through and the affliction, the trials that we face must lead us to repentance. And repentance is going to uh, cause us to turn and go away from what we have been doing and to treat our brethren differently. To treat the message differently. To treat Christ differently. Yeah, because if we don't if we don't learn from our our afflictions, how will we ever learn of the grace of Christ? So in his sufferings and humiliation, he was made sport. He was jeered. He was mocked. What else do we see here? Comment from the chat. That reflection and affliction fit with the Yom Kippur or High Holy Day period, which is occurring now, the biblical period. The movement has great need for the opportunity of reflection. 
we should not be setting it aside. As you were saying earlier, we need to learn more of our own weakness. We have greater need of repentance now than we have ever had before. Now, this is the moral story. How do we turn this upside down? In what manner do we do this? How do you see it? Well, I mean, if we turn this this story upside down, the moral part of this, this portion of it, yes. Yeah, I don't think we need to turn this one upside down necessarily, other than to show that there is, uh, they come together. That is, I believe that the, the parts of this movement have to come together. The, this message has to be united. I mean, we wouldn't take the turning on its head to have some opposite of this, because this is a positive thing, right? So the negative aspects of the story, we turn on their heads, right? All right. Not the positive things. But it's the negative that leads to the positive in this section. Yeah, I mean, you could just say he learned more of his own weakness, so that means we learn of God's strength, right? But the afflictions lead them to repentance. It leads everyone to repentance. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a positive part of this story, because we have a positive aspect in this moral story, and say that, well, we would look for the opposite of it. And in this situation where his hair began gradually to grow, is this a symbol of his beginning to really understand his greater need of Christ where his strength begins to return? Yeah, and but it would also represent uh, the message. Okay. An understanding of the message, right? Because his hair represented the seven times. All right. So, so that's in the symbolic story. We have this seven times that, is, um, that needs to be fully understood. Okay. Now we are soon to come to the close of our meeting today. Do we have any other thoughts or comments or questions? One thing that really stands out so clearly for me is that Samson, it's in myself, it's in all of us. Sometimes we prefer the pleasures of sin or the pleasures of following our own inclinations to following God's calling. But, you know, the psalm says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and we need to be walking in accord with him and that he leads us step by step only if we're willing to follow. And God help us to keep following because the end result of the opposite course is death, like spiritual okay. death. All right. Any other comment or thought? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, help us to reflect, help us to learn, help us to understand our great need of repentance at this time. Help us to hear the trumpets that are sounding so that we may be more prepared to truly live 
within this heavenly day of atonement. Be with us now. Please guide us and direct us. Through this day and through all of the events of this day, so that you may be more properly represented in all that we do. We ask that you be with each one. Direct us now. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.